Burning Izzy, Melvin Burgess, Chapter 17 As I walked along the valley, I could see the hulk of Pendle Hill. Across there were little houses of the Rothleys, my old home. It was like another world now. I would love to have called to see Nat and Gil, but it was too dangerous for them. I turned my face away and carried on toward Cologne, draped across the hillsides in front of me. But as I drew near my goal, the devil whispered to me again and my will began to slacken. It was one thing to confess myself, but I knew that would not be enough. They would want me to accuse Ihan and Tolly, and now that seemed hard. I thought of Ihan's hands. I forgot about the whole man and instead saw Ihan laughing with fun. I saw the little friendly spirits in her garden. I thought of serious old Tolly tucking the baby cabbages in the earth as if he were putting them to bed. And when I thought that I had to bring them to jail and cause them to be broken and whipped and hanged, I did not feel holy about it. It made me sick. I told myself, it is the devil speaking to you, don't listen. I remember my promise not to think such thoughts again. But to my doubt, but my doubts were too strong to be ignored. For the first time in ages I thought of Jeanette, and suddenly I wanted to see her. There was no difference between us now. We were both witches against our will. I thought bitterly, fool witch that I was, foul witch that I was. I could not keep away from my own kind, not even when I not even when I could put my soul out of danger within the hour. But then I thought I could do some good in my last hours of freedom. Perhaps I could convince Jeanette to come with me to confess. That would help redeem my soul and perhaps save her as well. Parson Holden told me that if I confessed I might not be hanged. Why not Jeanette too? That provided me with an excuse. I turned my face away from Cologne and headed toward Pendle and Melton Tower. The sun was shedding some early warmth on the pastures under Pendle Hill. I thought it unlikely the witches would be at home when the weather was good, and when I first got there it seemed there was no one at home. Even so, I was too scared to go near and hid behind a wall some way off to wait for Jeanette. A few minutes later, Jeanette came out of the hovel, followed by her uncle James. They were filthier than ever, and they moved slowly out into the thin sunshine, like a pair of big damaged insects, picking their way with careful little steps over the rubbish around the hovel. James crept round out of the wind and sat up and sat his back to the wall, huddling himself up and pulling his rags closely around him. He seemed to be very tired, but I saw his bright, intense gaze at the dirt between his knees before he closed his eyes and hung his head. I thought he must be suffering in some way. Jeanette followed him and sat a few metres off. She was wearing even less than he was, and she just folded her arms around her little chest, let her head loll to one side and stared listlessly away beyond the hills of Cologne. The two sat not speaking for several minutes. Eventually James spoke. Jeanette shook her head. He got angry and shouted, and she climbed up on her feet and began to loiter off down the hill to walk alone. Again, that strange, picking, cautious walk. I waited until she was out of sight of the house and then ran to catch her up. She heard my feet on the ground and turned. She took a couple of steps toward me, but then stopped. I thought at first that she might not be pleased to see me from the way she just stood there, but when I got her, when I got to her, she clung on to me and whispered my name in my hair over and over and began to cry. As I squeezed her back, I knew why she hadn't run to me and why she walked like an old woman. Every bone in her body stuck out like knuckles through her dry skin. She leaned against me if it was an effort to stand was too much. She and James were starving to death. We stood for a minute like that in the middle of the stony fields, embracing in the wind. Then Jeanette muttered, 
let's go get into some shelter. She nodded to a shepherd's hut in the next field. We made our way over to the stony pasture towards it. No one gives us anything these past few weeks, she said. I had given Jeanette the remains of the bread in my pack. She'd been without food so long she seemed to have forgotten hunger and began gnawing at it tidily. But as she ate, her hunger returned and she finished by bolting it down like a dog. Then she lay back to digest it. She saw me looking at her fleshless thighs and grimaced. They've decided to wipe us out, she told me. Baldwin's word for the law, but Baldwin's word was law in Pendle now. No one dared give food to the witches for fear of being accused themselves. There are always people glad of excuse to turn their back on the beggars, witches or not, but not even the more generous folk had a chance to take their revenge for the years of fear of Demdike and her family had over them. Then a few weeks ago, Alison had a, met a pack man on her way into Cologne and tried to beg and tried to beg pins from him. He had refused her and she had cursed him. Not a mile later, he'd fallen to the ground, paralysed and unable to speak. Everyone was surprised, not least Alison, and Demdike believed it must be surely and be nothing more than coincidence. But Alison was convinced she'd done it and the con and coin done it and was conscience stricken. This was the chance the witch finder had been waiting for. He had interviewed Alison and got a confession from her. On the strength of it, he had arrested Demdike and Lizzie. The rumour was they had been tortured and now every witch in Pendle lived in fear of arrest. It was not just the witches who lived in fear. Once he'd fallen into Baldwin's hands, it made little difference whether you were a witch or not. You would certainly confess to whatever lies he put into your mouth. With the feared old woman put away, all hold on Malkin Tower brood held all hold the Malkin Tower brood held over the poor people melted away. <coughs> Excuse me. They had become outcasts and barely a crust or a penny had been given to them since that time. Only Nat had helped them, although he'd had little enough to spare. Since the, coming, since the coming of the witch finder, he'd made no business himself as a cunning man and had to accept help from his neighbours. Now even he gave nothing. Parson Holden had ordered him to cease under threat of arrest. I was glad to hear Nat and Gil were safe and well. It had happened in the past that wise men had to lie low once in a while and I knew he had good neighbours who would help him until good times came again. But the witches had no such friends, and it was a miserable fate to be starved to death in the middle of community that bred them. Jeanette told me it was only a matter of time before she and James were arrested. She actually looked forward to it, as at least in jail she would get something to eat, however poor. When I told Jeanette my story, she nodded. Grandmother said I, Star, must be a powerful witch to trick her like that. She giggled. She was very angry. When we went round to show Gil the real mannequin, he laughed at her and she couldn't do anything about it. When I told her how I'd seen the devil at the Sabbath, her eyes went wide. Then she must be very powerful, she said. At our Sabbath, we only have one man who dresses up. And suddenly, I doubted everything all over again. It had been such a long way off. It was... It had all been such a long way off. It was night. I was frightened. Could it have been only that? A man in a mask? I told myself again, the devil was worming his way back into me. That I was filthy with sin. That I had to fight those seeds of doubt. I hurried to tell her about my plan. We can confess together, I urged her. Perhaps it will save you as well. Jeanette shivered. They'll hang me, she whimpered. Perhaps, but at least your soul will be safe. I sold my soul, she whispered. I showed you the mark. I belong to him now. There was no, there was no need between us to ask who he was. I told Jeanette what Parson Holden had told me, 
that God never abandoned his children, that he would forgive us so long as we truly repented and confessed. This seemed to be a new idea to her. She said that Demdike had told her that once she sold her soul it was gone for good and nothing or no one could ever get it back for her. That's what the devil wants you to believe, I told her. He doesn't want you to know that God is still waiting for you. Parson Holden said, he said that you might even be able to save me from the gallows. You don't think he'd lie to you? Jeanette thought not. And I have to confess to being a witch and to grandmother and to mother and Uncle James, she asked. I hesitated, but that was what the parson had said and I nodded. Jeanette took my hand. Did the parson really say it? Did he really say it? I can stop being a witch if I confess. Yes, he said that. Then I'll do it. I hate them. They made me a witch. I never wanted to. You know that. You'll tell them, won't you? Yes, I'll tell them. Are we going to do it now? Yes, now, I told her. She took my hand and we trailed down the hill towards Cologne. End of chapter 17